Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. Tonight, I want to share with you a little bit of a different project. Uh, I've been working on this on and off for the past two years. And essentially, it is a little handheld text-based adventure game. I got this idea right after I was introduced to a little game called Zork, courtesy of uh, Tim from Retroactive Gamers. This game is basically just a good old standard interactive book, uh, which was a very interesting concept for book writing back in the day. It's a book where you are able to make decisions and flip to a particular page where you can see the consequence of your decisions. And Zork was basically a computerized version of such an interactive book. Now, the concept of it was really appealing to me because I saw a very interesting way of making a game. A game that involves no sprites, no 3D modeling, no texturing, no painting, no art whatsoever, and you would still be able to tell a very interesting narrative and submerge the player into a world. So it is, for all intents and purposes, a video game. Now, I wasn't really interested in making another PC video game at that point. I already have plenty of PC games I have to work on as it is. So this was something that's so different, so unique in its aspect that I figured uh, it might be cool to put it on some sort of a proprietary handheld device. And yes, you could argue that I could make the same exact game on mobile devices, but where's the fun in that? I wanted to have buttons. I wanted to have switches. I wanted to have rotary dials. I wanted to have indicators that uh, show your statistics in the game. I wanted to make a text-based adventure game that offers a level of interaction that a mobile game simply cannot offer, which of course means a lot of physical input methods. Toggle switches, dials, faders, rotary encoders, potentiometers, all sorts of stuff that you simply cannot get with a mobile device. Literally the entire idea was to make a gimmick. And sure, some people might say that gimmicks is exactly what you don't want to put in into a piece of hardware you're designing. But considering that my goal here isn't to mass produce some sort of a humongous, widely appropriated device, gimmicks is the very thing that would make this unique over any other text-based adventure game that runs on your mobile device or computer. So what I wanted to do is uh, make almost um, like some sort of a record, a vlog of where this device has started, where it has gone to, and where it is right now. Now, initially, I started doing this as a blog on my website, and uh, I soon realized that uh, whew, there's a lot of media that I have to handle, uh, mainly uh, transferring images from and to my phone, uh, transferring the photos and videos, and the idea with these blogs is so that they wouldn't take more time to do than the actual project would. So for this reason, I figured that maybe instead of blog posts, I might want to do videos. So without further ado, why don't we take a look at where we are. This right here is version one of the device. I'm actually quite surprised that uh, I did dismantle it or use it for some other project, but um, it is a very first step into me trying to figure out how I'm gonna go about doing this. First things first, uh, this is running on an Arduino Dewey by the looks of it, which is a uh, quite an interesting choice of microcontrollers. Uh, that is, yes, that's an Arduino Dewey. Now, the Arduino Dewey was an interesting choice because it actually had digital outputs, which means um, a digital to analog outputs, I should, I should say. Uh, which means I could output a range of voltages, which is something that you can use to create audio. And it was initially my plan to give this little handheld device audio capabilities, mainly to play back music, to set the atmosphere and set the mood, play back a few sound effects here and there, like uh, weapon shooting and reloading sounds, uh, pickup sounds. So even though it was a text-based adventure game, I did want to add some more conventional game components to it, mainly sound effects and music. So the very first prototype came with the very first set of problems and mainly the fact that this uh, little LCD display shield, which was going to be used to output the text and display your inventory, display options, it was actually intended 
for an Arduino Mega. And this is some sort of a Chinese clone of the board that I got off of an AliExpress page. Setting this display up was an absolute nightmare, partially due to the fact that uh, I've never dealt with LCD displays in my life before. And uh, there's a whole process of going through the display drivers uh, and toggling options on and off in the header files in order to make the Arduino Due effectively recognize the correct make model and the correct LCD driver chip uh, to just make it work in the first place. And back when I started this particular prototype, it was not a very well documented process. So it took me a lot of forum posts and asking for help on the Arduino forums in order to figure out how to finally get it to work. Not to mention this particular shield eats up a lot of pins on this microcontroller. I initially started with an Arduino Due because it has a lot of I.O. I could wire up a very sizable number of buttons, switches, faders and inputs for the purposes of game mechanics. And at the same time, what was the point of going with a Duo if the LCD shield itself will literally eat up almost a half, if not more, of all the available I.O. on this board. The biggest gripe was the fact that a lot of these pins were not even being used or were used for something that I did not need. Hence why you can see that I've uh, butchered this LCD display to no end just to try to get access to some of those unused pins. To be honest, this is one of those things that kind of drives me nuts with some of the shields that you can buy for the Arduinos. It's the fact that some of them will just use up pins that they have no business using. Or at least I wish they would have offered some sort of a pass through so that you could, um, I don't know, make use of the unused pins that it's occupying. I mean, look at this fat bastard. As soon as I put her on here, you can say bye bye to those pins right there. This is not available. Yeah, although so you see. <laughs> can see I've actually started adding some sideways pins in order to get access to them. Of course, this is an accumulation of a whole bunch of factors. First of all, this was back in 2019, where the selection of shields wasn't as abundant as it is nowadays. Documentation was kind of lacking or non-existent. A lot of it depended on you understanding header files, uh, being able to dive into the header files, reading the comments of the functions, and seeing if you can uh, make out what it is that the library maker had intended for you to do to get it to work on your particular board. This particular choice of LCD displays probably wasn't even the best option I could have gone with, but it's, uh, again, it's one of those cases where I have no idea what options are even available, what options are even compatible, and how to get any of this to work. So at this point, the fact that I did get this to work after some headache is nothing short of a miracle. And it does give me some sort of a starting point to orient myself of where I wanna go next with a different type of module. So that's the uh, main controller. Now, this is a text-based adventure game, and of course, you can't play a text-based adventure game without being able to input text. So my next step was to design and prototype a keyboard circuit board. And as beginner circuit board making goes, a lot of lessons have been learned on this one. Oh boy, where do I begin? First things first, the distinct lack of a ground plane was, uh, was kind of a dead giveaway. Uh, second of all, if you look at the keyboard to the side, you can actually see that all the buttons are freestanding on top of the pins. None of them are actually going through the pins on the other side. And of course, this is because when uh, I was setting up these buttons, I wasn't using any particular pre-existing button library or uh, button symbol in KiCad. I think back then the uh, sheer abundance of uh, options or maybe me not knowing how to properly use the search basically made the whole process of looking for a compatible button layout kind of a hassle. So I decided to opt in to well, just make my own symbol. And we all know how well that went. I reckon this is one of those steps that every beginner circuit maker is probably gonna have to go through one way or another. And of course, you can't be designing your first few circuits without doing a few botches in the process. This particular keyboard layout has a total of 30 buttons. And of course, that meant that uh, after the LCD display had eaten up its fair share, I was uh, probably gonna almost tap out the entire resource of leftover buttons on this microcontroller. 
So, in order to make the keyboard not eat up all the available GPIO pins and have some left for other input types, I decided to lay out the keyboard connections in a multiplexed style, which effectively means that instead of having each and every button have a dedicated GPIO pin on the microcontroller, instead, I treat the button rows as a single line of I.O., line of inputs. So, this means that uh, the topmost row has a total of what? So that means 10 GPIO inputs being eaten up by the first row of buttons. But for the next row, instead of dedicating another set of GPIO pins, I had simply selected a separate row. So this button and this button are technically connected to the same GPIO pin on the microcontroller. And all I have to do is I have to toggle which row I happen to be reading the data from. What that basically means is I've dedicated three separate pins on the microcontroller to either power this row of buttons, then this row of buttons, and this row of buttons. So all I have to do is say, if I wanna read the states of the first row of buttons, I send power to this row of buttons, and I turn all the other ones off. And then I read the state of the row. Then I turn this row off and turn this row on and read the state of this set of buttons and rinse and repeat for all the other rows I may have. So suddenly, instead of 30 pins, I only eat up a total of 13. And multiplexing is one of those things that takes place so fast that you will not notice any sort of latency difference. Certainly not for a text-based adventure game where the gameplay is oriented to be more turn-based, giving you plenty of time to type in your commands. And of course, the aforementioned botch was me incorrectly routing these last two buttons. Uh, these were being recognized as another button being pressed because I didn't correctly route their traces uh, to the correct row. Of course, to uh, fix that, all I had to do is just terminate one of these traces and um, run a couple of connection wires. Now, I really wish that I could turn this thing on and show you what the game was like back then, but the sad truth is, is that I don't have the project for this anymore. I think at some point I was testing out some sort of a test sketch, maybe for keyboard reading, maybe for some other sketch related to the game. But uh, unfortunately, I never wrote the original program back and I do not have access to that sketch anymore. And this was uh, way before I had integrated to Git repositories into my workflow to be able to roll back and get some earlier build of a project. So yeah, all we get is uh, just a blank screen. You can see the uh, screen quality isn't exactly the best. You can see the backlight uh, really comes through at certain angles. But hey, I mean, it's the first prototype and even if this wasn't, um, it's a fairly small project, right? It's uh, not an Apple device, so to speak. So we don't have to worry about achieving retina level display qualities. The keyboard layout itself was your standard QWERTY keyboard. Uh, it doesn't have any numbers. Uh, and then these two were essentially the space bar and then enter and delete. So that's um, quite limiting, but you could technically make a text-based adventure game with this. So yeah, there's uh, not a whole lot to really demonstrate here, to be honest. Uh, most of it is just uh, experiments in PCB, uh, designing, uh, sending up to the fab, soldering components and testing it. So for the most part, pretty cookie cutter, hobbyist electronic shenanigans happening here. So why don't we uh, move on and take a look at the next rendition of this little text-based adventure game. The next rendition of the project had me going down a bit of a different rabbit hole in terms of uh, what kind of hardware I'm going to be using to achieve this little project. You see, once I established the initial prototype, the keyboard was working, it was scraping data, I could power it from a power bank, so it was technically portable. I had technically had a prototype that I could start working on the software side of this project, which is, of course, where the 
limitations of the hardware had started creeping in. I had established the basic set of mechanics. I could type in commands. Uh, those commands would get parsed and interpreted. Uh, let's say if it's a go to command, and if you type in go to kitchen, it will take the character to the kitchen. If it's go to a backyard, the character will go to the backyard. Of course, if the current room had a door to the backyard, that is. The biggest problem I discovered is the limitation of the internal memory on the Arduino Due microcontroller. You see, as a text-based adventure game, there will be a lot of text. And text takes a lot of memory. Like, an unbelievable amount of memory. For a conventional computer, it really doesn't. You see, it's all about perspective. For a conventional computer, even with two gigabytes of memory, text is simple. However, for embedded systems and microcontrollers, the memory is in the range of kilobytes. Kilobytes! They still technically have more memory than most retro computers back in the day, but for the sort of text-based adventure game that I was trying to put together, it was not going to work. You see, the biggest problem you see, the biggest problem with a text-based adventure, or at least the approach that I chose to achieve it, is the fact that the text was being stored in a special type of file called JSON. And there's a very particular reason. JSON files are formatted data structure files. They have a particular format to them that is known to the programmer and when you know what the format is you can very easily navigate all sorts of data points within the json file just by using keys and values and if i was making a pc game the json file format would have been absolutely fine however with the microcontroller the json format is a bit of a double-edged sword. Specifically within a text-based adventure game, the flexibility of a JSON file is that you can address any type of data you want within your current location, for example. I could set up a room, and within that room, I would have a key value pair for containers, for enemies, for doors, for characters you can talk to and interact with and uh, engage in the dialogue with. And because of the way JSON data is structured, it's very, very easy to actually address those data points. And whereas with a computer, it is a perfectly trivial matter, with a microcontroller, the JSON files, as flexible as they are, is a bit of a double-edged sword. Because you see, the way JSON files organize their data structure is by the abundant use of parentheses, curly brackets, colons, and commas. A lot of the data is usually nested within one another. And of course, to separate it and to identify it, all these special symbols are used to get the job done. The problem, of course, is the fact that those symbols are also text. And they are also something that has to be loaded by the microcontroller and stored in the memory. Not only that, because JSON data stores information into key value pairs, technically, from the game perspective, we're pretty much interested in the values themselves. The keys are only used to navigate the data. What you see in the end are just the values themselves. Now, we can't toss out the keys because you need them to navigate the data structure, and thus they have to be loaded into the memory and also take up a lot of space. So my choices at that point were either abandon the idea of using JSON files, which was going to be a bit of a disappointment because uh, JSON files actually make it very easy to add expendability to your games, like for example, DLC content or community-made uh, stories, right? Community-made missions. If I were to, say, develop some sort of a hub, some sort of a forum where people can create their own stories and then people can just go into some sort of a option window and then download whatever narrative they want to play, using JSON data for something like that makes the whole process extremely trivial. And while there are other alternative data types that are specifically catered to giving you access to some sort of a data structure format that uses some sort of an abbreviated pointer memory based uh, alternative to key value pairs while still behaving much like key value pairs, I would have pretty much had to then develop my own interpreter and my own builder specifically to create something like that for downloadable content. It would have been a completely unknown format and I would have had to effectively develop uh, an entire 
well, community content builder specifically for that format, which I mean, sometimes you got to learn and sometimes you got to adapt and you just have to figure it out. Coincidentally, the uh, 2019 me said no for that. And that's how the second prototype came to be. You see, in order to resolve this little memory issue, I have opted in to use a completely different microcontroller to get this whole thing up and running. I decided to go with a Raspberry Pi instead. Now, you're gonna have to uh, pardon the absolute mess that this particular prototype rendition is. You see, much like the uh, previous prototype, uh, it did work at some point, and then I uh, stripped it because I wanted to use the Raspberry Pi for something else, and I had moved on to a new prototype. This was using... Uh, there's actually a uh, couple of reasons why I switched to Raspberry Pi for the second prototype. First of all, of course, being the memory limitation of the microcontroller. You see, Raspberry Pis come with anywhere between 250, 512, maybe a couple of gigabytes of memory. I believe back then this was based on Raspberry Pi 1, uh, probably. It really doesn't matter which one it was based on because it allowed all the memory I would ever need to run this game with the JSON files. And usually this is something that you want to do. You want to first take a look at what demands your project has, and then you choose a solution that will satisfy those demands, not the other way around, which is how I uh, had experimented with a lot of these microcontrollers. I would just buy a variety of microcontroller packs and then figure out how can I retrofit some sort of a hefty feature onto them that they weren't really designed to run in the first place which hey, I, whatever man you gotta learn somehow right so having a raspberry pi as its brains meant a few very notable advantages first of all the lcd display is actually an hdmi based display which means no pins are being spent on basically driving an lcd display in the first place all the gpio is available to you to do as you please to attach whatever inputs and outputs you want so that was a definite bonus of course uh, another huge absolutely huge benefit to using a raspberry pi is because it ran linux now i don't like linux i'm a windows guy because it works it just works i don't have to download dependencies to run shit even nowadays in 2022 shut up and it was also the problem when I was setting up this system. One of the biggest advantages of the fact that Raspberry Pi was running on Linux is the fact that it handles all the memory allocation for you. And this was a huge, huge problem that I would have had to deal with on a microcontroller. You see, because Raspberry Pi runs on an operating system, it will handle any sort of garbage collection, any sort of um, memory juggling that uh, a computer would have to do to make sure that you don't essentially waste the available memory on your system. To bastardize a particular example, if you have a, uh, let's say, a small variable containing an X amount of data, you declare it, it is created, and now it takes up a certain amount of memory. Well, then what happens when you, let's say, declare two or three more variables? Well they will likely take up the adjacent space next to the variable you've just created, the first one. Well, what if you now say, I don't need the variable anymore? So you destroy the data inside of it and it just still sits there. So the, the memory is technically available, but the problem is that if you want to, let's say, create another storage for a larger chunk of information, that first declared variable space is not really available to you because it does not have enough space to fit the larger chunk of data. So now you have a problem that the longer your program runs, the more data you load, the larger you segment your whole memory pool and, well, then you have to start doing memory management. And that sucks. 
Memory management means you have to manually rearrange data on your microcontroller uh, memory blocks in order to take all the unloaded data, all the space that the unloaded data uh, was occupying and then toss it around and rearrange it so that finally you can maybe bunch it up with all the rest of the available data and make it available to you. That is a hugely bastardized version of the problem at hand with microcontrollers. And you see, computer kernels or computer operating systems do that for you. As soon as you unload a resource from the memory, that available space gets automatically juggled and pushed into the pool of all the available memory for you. You don't have to be the janitor of your own memory. That is, of course, the uh, downside of using microcontrollers for something as hefty as text. I mean, eventually, if I worked on it long enough, I would have learned how to do memory allocation, memory management on the microcontroller, and I'm sure I would have done something to make it work. But man, um, Raspberry Pi resolving that entire issue was kind of a no-brainer. I mean, what's better to learn how to deal with the problem than not to deal with it at all? Yeah, 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 I, I, I know. So, since I didn't have to uh, worry about a lot of the headaches with microcontrollers anymore, I actually managed to make quite a lot more progress with this particular prototype. And of course, it didn't come with its own problems, mainly uh, the fact that uh, all these prototyping solder wires just kept disconnecting and getting broken and the solder joints were fine, but the wires themselves were just so flaky that would disconnect if you looked them wrong. Also, uh, while prototyping this, I believe I actually went through a number of different uh, Raspberry Pis, uh, likely starting with the Raspberry Pi Zero, and um, I wasn't really too hot on the idea of soldering the wires directly to the Raspberry Pi, so I ended up going with one of these uh, prototyping shields. You just pluck them on top of your Raspberry Pi and then you can solder in all the wires to the, all the correct terminals uh, without actually soldering anything to the Raspberry Pi. Uh, considering that, you know, especially nowadays with the chip shortage and Raspberry Pis being nowhere in sight, um, yeah, being able to not butcher your Pi is probably a solid way to go about things. This of course meant that the brains of the whole handheld were separate from the actual, well, I.O. and uh, well, you know, it came with particular problems, which of course meant that it wasn't really as portable as, uh, well, I was hoping it would, even for a prototype. But nevertheless, it did work when it worked, and uh, it did allow me to add some additions to the I.O. Uh, mainly, we have an extra button in the keyboard. Of course, uh, as you can see, this is still me reusing the same batch of uh, botched keyboards that I had designed for the first prototype. You can see same exact uh, botch wires running from the enter and the backspace buttons. I've also added a uh, joystick because since the Raspberry Pi was technically a computer, computer with a graphical user interface, uh, with a keyboard and mouse, I needed to have a way of launching the application, which means I needed a way to attach a keyboard and mouse to the Raspberry Pi in order to launch my Pi project. This actually led me to slightly modify the way the keyboard was being connected to the microcontroller. You see, whereas with the original, the microcontroller was toggling rows of buttons in order to read the states of the buttons, and the microcontroller itself had direct access to these buttons. With the Raspberry Pi version of the project, I resorted to using a separate microcontroller, which in this case was a Arduino Leonardo Mini, I believe, it's a Pro Mini, uh, which effectively is a small microcontroller with built-in keyboard and mouse emulation. And I simply connect the USB out of the microcontroller into the Raspberry Pi, which effectively made this entire keyboard uh, act as a, quite literally, a standard PC keyboard, and this joystick I had uh, turned into essentially a mouse pointer. So I could run the pointer up, down, left, right, and the uh, button action of the joystick acted as a left mouse click. So technically, this particular prototype involved two brains, one for handling keyboard and mouse, and one, and one for handling the actual brains of the operation, the Raspberry Pi. I've also added a little 
toggle switch, you can see that uh, its default state is in the middle, and then you can push it up or push it down. Uh, it's a momentary switch, so it returns back to the center position, and uh, a little push button. Uh, and this little aggregate is effectively supposed to be used for looting, item looting, which means um, it worked in a fairly simple way. You walked into a room, and then if you see a crate, you would uh, type in open crate, and then a little window pops up on the side. You can use this little toggle button to select which item you want to grab, press a button, pop-up will appear, and then you press, uh, you, you choose what operation you want to do to it, like take one, take all, close, cancel, and then press the button, you know, to pick up the item. Now, luckily, I actually have a documented example of this prototype working which to be honest i'm not sure why i wasn't doing video documentations of all the other prototypes working but um here it is this is what it looked like all right let's take a look at where we are I'm gonna skip this a ruined house living room dilapidated living room with haphazardly boarded up windows rays of light slid through the cracks all right sounds like a dump uh let's see we got a cigar box over there and we got a couple of exits uh let's enter the basement. Dark damn basement. There's a utility box. All right, let's take a look at what's in there. Open box. Ooh, cartridges. Okay, never have uh, too many cartridges. I'm gonna take all of that. Take you. Take you. And let's take that as well. Nice. Okay, I might as well take the combination wrench. Scrap that. Use it later. Nice. Alright, let's um let's get going. Nice. I must admit that was a pretty damn pivotal point in the uh, development of this project because that was the first prototype that just worked. You may also have noticed a couple of things that were in that video that aren't on this prototype right now. Mainly the Nixie tubes that you found at the very top of the display. Yes, ever since I discovered the Nixie tubes, I have been obsessed with that beautiful amber glow. And I absolutely wanted to have Nixie tubes on this prototype. Now as, now as prototypes go and as available the Nixie tubes are, uh, whenever I move on to the next prototype, I tend to strip out the core components that are more rare and then just retrofit them onto the next rendition rather than just kind of leaving them on this one and, uh, well, not really being able to use them ever again. Fear not, however, the uh, Nixie tubes in question are actually right here on my bench, still intact, still working, and I can still adjust the... Uh, high voltage regulation to get that nice beautiful amber glow unfortunately the uh, microcontroller circuit or the uh, driver circuit that i was using had uh well since given up the dust i will say it's kind of unfortunate but for my very first high voltage driver circuit to actually work and not arc like mad i would say it's an achievement nonetheless of course, another aspect you may have noticed in that little video is the clicky sound that the Nixie tubes made whenever the counter of how much of in-game currency you have collected goes up. Technically, Nixie tubes don't make that much of a noise when they flip, but having played games like Fallout, um, having an audible feedback is just a very satisfying thing to have to a lot of visual effects and visual components. So even though they don't make a sound, giving them some sort of a characteristic sound was a, quite an appealing idea. So what I had done is wire up an array of relays at the bottom of uh, the module and uh, effectively, every time the, the Nixie tubes counted up to the next digit, I made one of these four relays uh, effectively click on and off. So the relays serve no other purpose other than to add some sort of an audible click to the Nixie tubes. I was experimenting with a solenoid uh, to, well, achieve the same effect, but the uh, the speed of the solenoid was not sufficient enough to keep up with the uh, speed of Nixie tubes being updated. Another thing about the Nixie tubes I want to mention is that it is getting increasingly tricky to find ways to drive Nixie tubes. Mainly the uh, driver circuit that I was using on these, which effectively runs on 
HV5122, I think. HV5122PG, uh, shift register style uh, current sinking driver, is out of production. So whatever is available in stock now is all that's going to be available ever. And this kind of goes true for a very large amount of high voltage um, driving circuits out there. I don't know what's happening. Suddenly high voltage drivers aren't something that people need or something, but uh, there's only a handful of brands that really make high voltage driving circuits. Mainly uh, a microchip has a few high voltage shift register current sinking uh, drivers. But um, on the bright side, if you don't have drivers, you can always use uh, MOSFETs. Of course, it's going to immensely increase the footprint of the driving circuit, considering that uh, one of these Nixie tubes effectively carries about 10 connections uh, from zero to nine. And sometimes they may even include a little dot or a comma or some sort of additional symbol. That means uh, for a six digit Nixie display like this, I would need a grand total of 60 MOSFETs. Good Lord. But uh, I mean, again, at the same time, they're about what? 80 cents a pop. So sure, I could very well just design a circuit that uh, fits, you know, 60 of these MOSFETs. And that's just the reality of it. That's just what you have to do if you want to add six Nixie tubes to your project. Nevertheless, it's you know good experience and good practice to create circuit boards like that. So. Eh, you know, it is what it is. I will note, this prototype also prompted me to add an ability to type in numbers into uh, the program. And of course, uh, this keyboard did not facilitate a range of numbers for it, hence why I had added this uh, additional button in the bottom left corner, which effectively acted as a shift button. So this allowed me to turn the entire first row into number button. So I would hold it down and press this button and that would become, what is it? Like button number six by the looks of it, right? This would be button number zero or nine or whatever. So as of the next iteration, I would have to make sure that I have some sort of a um, shift button implemented into the layout. You can also spot this little aggregate here. Uh, this was a 3D printed mount for a number of uh, selector switches. These selector switches is something that you find on really old radios or really old televisions. It's a big fat knob that takes a lot of girth to actually rotate and it has this extremely satisfying click uh, when you set it into position. As a matter of fact, I actually have an unused one here somewhere. Aha, there it is. <laughs> yeah, see, this is the sort of stuff you can't achieve with a mobile game. So the idea with the switch is that it would go through one of these mounting holes. And of course, that little screw there would go on the other side. And then it would act as a, almost like a menu selector. Because I got to hold it down. Now, of course, this particular one uh, does not offer continuous rotation. It has a uh, starting point and an ending point, and you cannot uh, loop back around to continue, which is why this particular one is uh, just sitting on my shelf waiting for a different kind of project. I did end up finding a set of uh, switches like that that offer continuous rotation, which is what is present on the next prototype. The rest of the stuff is fairly standard cookie cutter stuff. It's uh, it got a little uh, voltage converter here that allows me to uh, select what voltage I need with this little potentiometer here. Uh, this gives me, I think, the ability to power some of the circuitry that was running either at 5 volts or 12 volts. Because the, uh, the Nixie tube driver here, or the converter uh, power supply, uh, takes a 12 volt input and it uh, converts it to a range between 170 to 220 volts using a similar kind of uh, variable resistor. So that was the second prototype. 
Uh, and it was around this point when I started thinking that this whole mess of wires, this whole giant bundle of nonsense was just not a very good way to prototype because I wanted to reach a point where I could just pick up the prototype and let's say go to a different room uh, or connect it to a laptop or go somewhere and um, just continue working on the story, continue working on the game mechanics. I didn't want to lug around this giant pube rat's nest uh, anywhere I go, so it was time to make a prototype that was a bit more self-contained. This is the text-based adventure prototype Mark III. At this point, the project itself was labeled Lonesome Trail uh, after the uh, DLC from Fallout's New Vegas. This was a completely self-sustained, fully functional, at least at the time, prototype for the text-based adventure game. You can see that in comparison to both of the previous prototypes, this is a uh, substantially larger hunk of hardware. Borrowing from the uh, previous design, it sports a custom-made circuit board for the keyboard, this time including the separate rows for numbers, an escape key, we got uh, your basic space, backspace, enter, uh, we've got uh, page up and page down because this unit was actually still running on a Raspberry Pi. We got the control, we got the shift buttons, and this allowed us to also implement some custom uh, symbols into the keyboard. The entire keyboard ended up being substantially larger, now pretty much requiring quite uncomfortable thumb travel in order to reach some of the keys, whereas this was very quite compact and very quite portable. So if there's one thing that I would probably take away from this particular build is that um, I want to return to a smaller form factor. This is... Uh, you see, I really have to strain the thumbs to reach some of these buttons. But hey, unless you build it and try it and know what the problem is, you don't really know where to look for one. Raspberry Pi 1 was still the brains of this operation, although by this point Raspberry Pi 2 and 3 were already out and Raspberry Pi 4 was just around the corner. In the beginning of this prototype, at least um, I was working with what I had access to, but this unit did go through a Raspberry Pi 1 and it then switched to a 0. Uh, I then experimented with Raspberry Pi 3B, which actually offered a uh, huge boost in performance, which allowed me to do some really neat things. And then I finally switched to Raspberry Pi 4. Now, with that said, how was I actually running the program? or what was actually running the program. Well, it's your good old friend Python, because this was now running on pretty much a fully fledged computer. In order to make the game, all I had to do is just use any graphical user interface capable uh, software environment, like let's say Python and Pygame. That's right, we went from running raw C code on a microcontroller straight to making a Python game using a little game engine called Pygame. Pygame was a little bit clunky compared to a lot of game engines that I'm used to working in, but it was more than capable to achieve whatever it is I wanted to achieve and then some. This was another benefit of using a Raspberry Pi. All the media playback uh, functionality was just built in. I could draw backgrounds, I could draw sprites, I could scroll images, I could make certain effects, I could skew the screen to give it that um, that cathode ray tube magnet distortion effect, maybe even some chromatic aberrations for when you take damage or when you're low on health. Python and Pygame were the perfect home for this particular project. Between Pygame's audio playback, music playback, uh, all the visual sprite drawing functions, and Python's ability to interface with the physical GPIO pins on the microcontroller, including things like uh, working with expansion ports to add additional pins to your microcontroller, which is how I got these nice little menu selection switches up and running. It just simply made sense. It was the perfect solution to run this little project on. Until something bad happened. In retrospect, it had nothing to do with Python, it had nothing to do with Raspberry Pi, and it had nothing to do with, well, anything here really. You see, 
when I was prototyping some of the features for this prototype rendition, I had accidentally shorted, uh, I think it was a 12 volt line um, with one of the GPIO pins on the microcontroller. And unfortunately, when you do that, the Raspberry Pi doesn't give you a warning. It just goes, lights out, that's it, donezo. That happened around the time when uh, I started using the Raspberry Pi compute modules uh, for the whole project. Um, this whole keyboard panel basically just uh, sits on a couple of adhesive strips. And underneath this uh, was one of the uh, Raspberry Pi compute module development boards. I first went with uh, Raspberry Pi compute module three development board, which uh, worked out pretty well quite an interesting experiment. And uh, I must admit, I am much more impartial to this uh, SODIMM style uh, compute module form factor than the new uh, insert seating slots of the compute module four. And uh, after running the project on this one, I had switched to running it on the compute module four version of the development board. As before, I uh, didn't want to solder directly onto the development board because this thing is like 120 bucks. So I was using one of these prototyping boards to wire up all the connections. And um, at some point I had wired up what I believe was the Nixie tube 12 volt uh, buck converter, accidentally bridging it to one of the GPIO pins on the development board. And of course, thus frying one of these compute modules. Now. Now the compute modules aren't cheap. With the uh, the start of the pandemic and the chip shortage, they were no longer available. I mean, sure, like grabbing one and lifting it off off of the uh, seated connectors, and then just grabbing a new one, popping it back in, was fairly straightforward. If you had access to any, most of the stores that I've looked at are out of stock for the compute modules. And most of the stores that have them in stock have priced them up to the point where it actually doesn't make sense to use it. I mean, sure, we're at the tail end of the pandemic now and uh, um, availability is bound to come back, but this actually got me thinking on whether or not I wanna base this project on something so fragile and so volatile as a Raspberry Pi. and. This is something that made me recall the numerous times that I've been given the advice of not basing my projects on Raspberry Pi if I'm planning on doing any sort of, uh, say, um, small production run of these things. I didn't believe it. I, I didn't think it was going to be a problem. I thought, hey, these things are, you know, with Raspberry Pi, what, 10 bucks? Um, yeah, no, they're always going to be available. There goes that plan. So yeah, Raspberry Pi was a fantastic solution to this project. And just as easily as it came, it had left. I mean, it makes sense. Raspberry Pis are phenomenal. They're very flexible. They have a ton of libraries. They run Python for Christ's sake, which in itself is a huge ecosystem. Of course, it would be a very powerful and a very demanded microcomputer, which is the reason why it was susceptible to chip shortage and availability and effectively scalping. In retrospect, I would have still had a perfectly fine working prototype if I was more careful with my soldering and using the tweezers, using the screwdrivers and not accidentally bridging the connections uh, of a 12 volt line to the Raspberry Pi GPIO. And this has happened twice, actually. I've fried two of these things, same exact mistake. So at this point, my solutions are either find a new microcontroller to base this project on or don't be an idiot and uh, don't do the Apple thing and don't put, you know, a 12 volt line next to a 3.3 volt line. Uh, God. <laughs> Seriously, Apple does that. They should hire me. I, I, would, I would stick to the program. My resume would say, hey, you're looking for somebody to design shitty circuits with bad practices? You'll never believe what I've done twice. As much as I would like to show you this prototype, it is dead. I honestly was really upset about the circumstance. 
The fact that um, the Raspberry Pi has proven to be an unreliable source of parts to base your project on was kind of a kind of a blow but nevertheless it did show me the possibilities of using a computer rather than a microcontroller to drive a project like this the reality still stands the memory management of a linux based microcomputer was a huge, huge bonus to achieving a project like this. So this got me thinking about what other alternatives to Raspberry Pi are available out there. And that, of course, has led me onto the trail of the BeagleBone. In this case, this is the BeagleBone Black. It is, uh, well, apparently it's supposed to be comparable to a Raspberry Pi 3 or a Raspberry Pi 2. It's a Linux machine and it uh, offers both headless and GUI based uh, environments. The developers of the BeagleBone had created a few uh, Debian Linux distributions uh, specifically catered towards the, well, the uh, this particular hardware set. So to me, this little board kind of well, made sense. It was still available. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was pretty abundant. Uh, I suspect because it is a third party, uh, I guess you would say this is a Raspberry Pi inspired clone. Uh, sure, yeah, it is a standalone thing ever since uh, it has been developed. Uh, it will be considered a standalone thing, but you can't deny that this basically was created because Raspberry Pi had proven to be such a immensely popular platform. The only problem with the BeagleBone is the support. Where with the Raspberry Pi, it would take me all of maybe 15 minutes to set up a new OS, a uh, install all the dependencies and copy over my project file and just hit run and be up and running. The project would just launch and it would work. With BeagleBone, it took me an entire month of just trying to get a window to open up. You see, a lot of the libraries that are available for the Raspberry Pi aren't available for the BeagleBone, or they're available in an alternate format that you have to manually compile and install, which is something that I don't do very often, hence why I use Windows, because I'm a Windows user where everything just works. Even after a month of trying to get it to work, even after the month of pestering the forums, searching, asking GPT chat to come up with these solutions, trying to get forum help, I couldn't get it to work. Well, technically, technically, I got it to the point where I could fairly easily install the X server on the headless version of the operating system because I don't need the desktop environment because this thing would be running a custom GUI window. Uh, but I would need X server in order to create windows, uh, create GUI windows, that is. I did technically get it to the point where I had been able to create a Python take hinter window. I never got Pygame to run on it. I, I te technically, I got Pygame to run, but it never rendered to the screen. It never rendered through the frame buffer. And this was a month in of just daily grueling, daily trying to figure out what's missing. It's I'm trying to install a library. It's missing dependencies. I try to look for dependencies. Uh, they're not available in a package manager. I have to custom download it. There's no install file. You got to compile it or you got to download it from the Git repository and make the file yourself. Ugh. So Jesus, man, with the Raspberry Pi, it's just everything's already made because it's such a widely used platform. Everything is just already built. You just have to download it and bam, everything runs. The amount of time and effort I have sunk into trying to get the project to run on the BeagleBone, uh, especially with forum answers stating stuff like I would have to recompile Pygame and the frame buffer and whatever else dependency I may need to get it to run under the BeagleBone, kind of made me start to question whether or not Linux was the way to go. And to be honest, this has been my lifelong experience with Linux. Every time I give Linux a chance, 
it just it doesn't it doesn't work as a matter of fact i had probably made more progress running on the very first rendition the very first prototype running on c on the microcontroller than i did trying to get the beagle bone to run i really would like to make it work i would like to clarify this i would like to clarify this i did get the beagle bone to launch some sort of a python take inter based gui application so i'm not in a complete corner with the beagle bone the problem is that i can't get the pi game version of the program to run so both pi game and take inter uh pi game is a game engine so it gives you all the visual uh features drawing sprites drawing panels and colors and gradients and everything take inter is more software based rather than game based so it's not as versatile in its visual presentation but i did get take inter to work so if push comes to shove i could remake the game using take inter as a graphical user interface pipeline i won't get things like post-processing effects and chromatic aberration screen distortion because take inter isn't a game engine it doesn't have a need for these sort of effects i could drop all those features um, and simply well have a much more i guess cookie cutter version of the game layout but the visual aesthetics that I've been able to achieve using Pygame's graphical commands would be quite a detrimental loss to the aesthetics of the whole game. And this is where it was just a drop in a bucket of other arguments um, against the BeagleBone. When I got the BeagleBone to run, uh, I noticed that the speed that actually ran the Pygame application at was severely, severely crippled compared to a Raspberry Pi. And even though I didn't get to see the visual of the game appear on the screen, I could tell that it was running at a crippling speed because in the Raspberry Pi game, there's a particular effect. It's like a ticking sound that plays back every time a letter is typed on the screen. Whenever you type in a command like look around, the game will give you a response. It says, you're in the living room, there's so-and-so around you, dust particles appear in the rays of sun shining through the boards of the windows. Um, it will type up that text one character at a time. And there's a sound effect that plays back when every character is typed. So knowing what the very first message is when you launch the game, I could tell that the amount of time just by hearing the ticking sound that a beagle bone took to print all that text was almost 10 times as long as the amount of time it took the Raspberry Pi to print the same text. Just by listening to how many ticks there were and how long it spanned for, basically told me that the beagle bone black at least was severely, severely underpowered for the task at hand. Not to mention that I ended up frying one of the beagle bones as well. <laughs> Granted, that part is on me uh, because it was once again the 12 volt power supply uh, connector on the Nixie tube circuit uh, that I ended up accidentally bridging to the GPIO of the Beagle Bone. At this point, I should probably redo the design of the circuit so that the high power pins are nowhere near the logic lines on the Nixie tube driver board. This is entirely on me, just entire, completely on me. This is just my, my fault entirely. I've burned three Raspberry Pis and one Beagle Bone in trying to get this to work. I should probably learn the lesson by now and just redo the damn circuit. Move the high voltage pins away from the logic pins, okay? But this is, this is where I'm at right now. Considering everything that I have gathered from this particular prototype, with the form factor, with the dimensions, with the brains that I'm using for this uh, project, I figured that maybe, maybe, maybe I should go with a microcontroller instead of a microcomputer. Maybe it shouldn't be a Linux solution. Maybe I should go back to using some sort of a, well, resource rich, high power microcontroller that gives me more than enough resources to work with, but doesn't run Linux and just continue the project from then on. Of course, this would be uh, going right back into the pool of having to do memory allocation, memory management. Um, but considering that the first prototype where that was a concern was made in 2019, and right now it's we're on the borderline of 2023, um, I figured 
maybe I can give it another go and see how my perspective might have changed in the last three years. I will also have to deal with uh, sound playback because, well, the benefit of Linux and Raspberry Pi and Pi game was that all of that stuff was just handled for me. But this time around, I'm going to have to do it by myself, um, all from scratch. Of course, the benefit is that I wouldn't have to deal with uh, all the annoyances of Linux, like having to deal with permissions, having to make sure the permissions don't get cleared every time you restart the operating system. Still having to figure out the answer to that one. It's like for every problem Linux solves, it just raises five more. And I can already hear a distant noise of clicking and clacking of keyboard warriors. All the Linux users saying, Oh man, I use Linux and I, got, I don't have a problem with Linux. I use Arch. It's just, I know that it works fine for you. It does not work fine for me. I don't care how well it works for you. This is just the reality. So where does the prototype sit now? Well, it sits exactly where I said it would sit. Here is the current prototype. This is, of course, just the very, very, very beginning of it. But um, this time around, I'm looking at an ESP32 microcontroller. This thing is a beast. It's got built-in Wi-Fi, built-in Bluetooth. Um, it's got a huge, huge lot of memory, uh, which is, uh, in comparison to an Arduino Due, is actually uh, quite, quite plentiful to go around. There will have to be memory management, and I might have to consider about splitting my uh, game data into smaller files and just kind of load them in chunks. But it does provide a certain starting point. And of course, the uh, display module is uh, the Adafruit uh, RA8875 driver board, which only takes about, what, five pins? And in comparison to the uh, giant parallel monstrosity that the first prototype was using with the Arduino Due, the monitor is actually quite a lot larger, and um, uh, there's a particular quirk that I want to achieve, which is a, an acrylic lens overlay that would make the, the image bulge out in front of you, make it look like a cathode ray TV. But, um, you know, GUI works, um, backlight is kind of okay. Seems to be a, at least a good starting point. And uh, right now I'm just trying to figure out how to get the Nixie tubes to uh, interface with this board. And uh, yeah, so as far as uh, progress goes, well, the train is still rolling. I am by no means set on the ESP32. This is just something that works right now and they're very abundant at the moment. Um, you can find them on AliExpress, on Amazon, uh, you can find them on eBay, just anywhere. These are very, very abundant microcontrollers, which is a huge, huge point uh, in my book. Now, I have by no means put a nail in the idea of using a Linux computer. I would absolutely love to be able to use it specifically because it resolves the problems of memory management, uh, providing me with an abundance of memory and also uh, offering things like uh, easy media management, audio playback, being able to use Python and uh, Pygame, not having to worry about uh, audio playback circuitry, and just generally having Python and uh, Python libraries that would allow me to easily expand this project would definitely help. And uh, of course, I would be able to just reuse my current existing Python version of the software without having to recode the whole thing from scratch on the microcontroller. If you have suggestions over what you might think might be a good platform for this project, let me know. I would absolutely love to, uh, to experiment with some options because as far as options are, they're pretty slim for me right now because I primarily don't really know what else is out there. So let me know down in the comments uh, below. I'll see you guys in the next video where hopefully I will have the next form factor of this prototype up and running, perhaps something more handheld and with all the features already included. I'll see you guys in the next video and um, hope you enjoyed.